type, I will record the talk again because we had technical problems. I was sharing my notes screen and not my presentation screen. So the image, image quality and the videos are not clearly seen as I would expect. So I will record the talk again. So thank you very much, Dr. Hamid, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to talk about a proposed variant of BPPB that our group at Favalor Foundation at Buenos Aires, Argentina, have recently described. This, uh, this is a proposed variant of posterior canal that we called sitting up BPPB. Vestibular symptoms on sitting up is a common in the general population and in patients seen by vestibular medicine specialists. When you see a patient with these symptoms, you should of course rule out hemodynamic, orthostatic dizziness and vertigo, structural abnormalities, central positional nystagmus, vestibular migraine, PPPD, but outside of these causes, there is no much reference written in the literature on this topic. Bela Buki and Dominic Strossman reported on uh, 2011 a variant of subjective vertigo that they call type 2 BPPV, in which patients complain of short spells of vertigo when sitting up from this whole pipe maneuver, but without any oculomotor findings. They reported a series of 200 outpatients with, uh, with vertigo or dizziness. 20% of them presented with classic variants of BPPB, but a larger group of 43% presented with what they call type 2 BPPB. So they reported that the symptoms arise when sitting up from one side, but not the other side, this whole pack maneuver, the symptoms were lateralized and they could record or document postural truncal oscillations on sitting up by means of a special posturographic examination bed. So they proposed a posterior canal short arm canalolithiasis as putative mechanism. They proposed that the otoconia would be in the short arm of the posterior canal and when the patient adopts the Tisholpike maneuver posi and position, the, the debris will fall to the vestibulum and then when the patient sits up, the debris will fall again to the short arm of the posterior canal, evoking or eliciting the vestibular symptoms. In our clinic, we noticed a group of 15 patients with an unusual nystagmus pattern on sitting up from this whole pack position maneuver that caught our attention. Eight out of 15 of these patients were retest post-canalit repositioning maneuver for typical posterior canal BPPV that were treated by ourselves in our clinic, and four of them were early retest, so less than an hour had passed from the original uh, EPLI maneuver. In four out of 15 patients, canalit repositioning maneuver were performed in other clinics for positional vertigo, but we didn't have any data regarding the nystagmus or the syndrome characteristics. All the patients had history of recurrent vertigo or BPPV, and most patients reported vertigo on sitting up and a persistent non-positional disequilibrium. So you will see an example. This lady is a retest for a previous uh, posterior, uh, right posterior canal BPPV that in which we perform EPLI maneuver the week before. The, this whole pack maneuver was negative, but we can see here that when we sit her up, she showed an abiting right torsional nystagmus that is suggestive of an ampurofugal excitatory right 
posterior cupular deflection. And you can see that the nystagmus is long lasting and not as paroxysmal as the typical posterior canal PPPV. This was another patient that it was a control, a retest for a left posterior canal BPPV with, in which we perform a pre-maneuver the week before. So whole left whole pack was negative. And then on sitting up, we can see how an up within left torsional nystagmus showed up. Again, it's a long lasting nystagmus. It lasts more than one minute and it has not the typical crescendo decrescendo paroxysmal pattern of the typical posterior canal BPPV. So we review the video oculography retrospectively this, of this score of patients in order to try to find out which could be the mechanism involved. Here we can see the findings on the different positional maneuvers and as you can see on the table there wasn't a standard protocol because we used different strategies depending on what we were seeing at the moment. Or include an inclusion criterion was to present an abiting torsion and nystagmus when sitting up from this whole pike maneuver. So we elaborated a model in order to try to explain the findings on the different positional maneuvers. We initially proposed a periampular canal olithiasis in which there is an anatomical restriction on the distal movement of the debris. So on whole pike position, the, the debris will not, will not move, move because this anatomical restriction, so we will not see any nystagmus. When the patient sits up by means of negative inertia, the debris will move near the posterior canal cupula and then when it re uh, the patient reaches the sitting position, gravity will start acting on the debris and make it move towards the uh, distal part of the canal, eliciting a displacement of the endolymph and then a ampulofibular deflection of the posterior cupula. When the debris reaches the anatomical restriction, it will act as a partial canal cham like a valve mechanism which prevents the normal backflow of the endolymph and so the returning of the posterior canal cupula to the resting position. So we see that the nystagmus that is long lasting and uh, have not the crescendo decrescendo paroxysmal pattern of the typical posterior canal BPPV. So now we will check if the findings in our patients correspond with the model. Uh, first, we will see an animation to better understand our hypothesis. On sitting up, the negative inertia will bring the otolith near the cupula and then it will move forward to the distal part. And now we will see how our model behaves on the different positional maneuvers. This was a patient that presented with right posterior canal BPPV. We performed a pre-maneuver the week before and this was the control. She presented with a beating, sitting up right nystagmus and on Jacobino maneuver, the step one of Jacobino maneuver, we see how it elicits the abiting right torsional nystagmus that again is non paroxysmal and long lasting. So in our series, sitting up from 
uh, striped head hanging was uh, positive in seven out of 10 patient tested. The, it elicits the abitorsion and nystagmus and the uh, step one and the step two of Jacobino maneuver elicits a bit in torsion and nystagmus in four out of five patients tested. So, how does our model behave or predicts that situation? We expect a similar phenomenon to that when the patient sits up from this hypac maneuver, when the plane of the anterior acceleration is similar to that of the posterior canal. Let's see an animation to better exemplify it. So when the plane of the head acceleration is similar to that of the posterior canal, the negative inertia will act in the same way as acts when the patient sits up from this whole pike maneuver. The same patient when we perform the head yaw test, rolling the head to the symptomatic right side, we see that it elicits the upbeating torsional nystagmus. And rolling the head to the contralateral side elicits a less intense downbeating contratorsional nystagmus with left torsional component in this case. So, in our series, rolling the head ipsilaterally elicits the stimulatory abit intorsional nystagmus in 8 out of 10 patients tested, and rolling the head contralaterally eh, elicits downbeat contratorsional nystagmus in 4 out of 9 patients tested. So, how our model predicts that situation? We can see that when we roll the the, the patient heads ipsilaterally, the periampular region of the posterior canal is quite vertical, so allowing the gravity acts over the debris and move it towards the distal part of the canal and eliciting an ampulofugal stimulatory deflection. On the other hand, when rolling the head to the opposite side, the periampular region of the canal is quite horizontal, so is the, the chances of the gravity acting over the debris are less and it's not frequent to find this downbeat intorsional nystagmus that suggests an inhibitory deflection of posterior cupula. But on the third step of the Epley maneuver on no stand position, we see in this patient that had the sitting up nystagmus from the left side, a downbeat in nystagmus with a subtle, not so visible, right torsional component, and we see that this nystagmus is sustained, indicative of a persistent inhibitory deflection of the posterior cupula. In our series, we saw this uh, downbeat torsion nystagmus in eight out of nine patient tested. Uh, and we will see how our model predicts or behaves in that situation. Now we are performing the epi maneuver. And in the third step, in the nose down position, we see how the periampular region is quite vertical, so it favors the action of gravity over the debris and uh, it remains over the cupula 
deflecting it in the inhibitory, in its inhibitory position. So after we develop this model on the last two patients of our series, we test a maneuver that switch between the two positions that mostly evoke nystagmus, which were those in which the periampulary region of posterior canal was closest to vertical. So we move the patient head from nose down position, in which periampulary region of the canal is over the cupola, 180 degrees to the other side, where the periampulary region is below the cupola. So this patient who had a sitting up nystagmus when sitting up from right whole pipe maneuver and contralateral nose down position, we can see a downbeating torsional nystagmus with torsional component to the left that is persistent. And then when we move her head 180 degrees to the other side, we will see that a, a beating torsional nystagmus with right with right torsional component starts beating. And it it behaves as a paroxysmal nystagmus with crescendo decrescendo pattern. Till it finally stops. So we will see now an animation. So in contralateral nose down position, debris will fall over the cupola, and then when we rotate the head to the other side, 180 degree, the periampular region is quite vertical, so we can see the debris go to the distal part of the canal till it reach the anatomical restriction, and we can see that a nystagmus pattern. So in the follow-up of our patient, we so no immediate response to canalid repositioning maneuver uh, that we try to do with this patient in order to solve this sitting up nystagmus. We try to do Epli, Simon, Demi Simon without success, but all patients resolve their positional vertigo and nystagmus by means of Brandarov domiciliary exercises. Three of them switch to typical posterior canal BPPV, one switch to horizontal canal BPPV, all of them had normal MRIs and no other signs of central uh, nervous system compromise, and three patients of this series record with ipsilateral posterior canal BPPV month after and record with sitting up vertigo after we perform Ipli maneuver. So we thought that those patients had some uh, anatomical predisposition to uh, develop this sitting up BPPV. So we published our findings and the model in otology and neurotology last year. We were very happy about it. So we continue looking for these unusual patients in order to test our hypothesis. And when they arrived, we saw some things which caught our attention and generated more questions and hypotheses. For example, we saw that on some patients, there was no latency since sitting up to the beginning of the nystagmus beating. For example, this lady had no latency between the sitting up movement and the starts of the nystagmus that is not so congruent with our hypothesis of the need of the movement of the debris by negative inertia force. 
we also tested sitting up with less acceleration and we saw that despite of being of less intensity, the nystagmus still showed up. We also saw the nystagmus when sitting up from the other side. The other side, this patient presented sitting up nystagmus when sitting up from right this whole pack maneuver. But in this case, we are sitting him up from left this whole pack maneuver, and we can see the abetting right torsional nystagmus, and that finding is not so congruent with our model. So it, it, it wasn't really explained about that. And now we can see that in this patient, the supine position, he has a persistent admitting torsional, right torsional nystagmus that increase its velocity when rolling the head 45 degrees to the right is a persistent nystagmus and increase its velocity even more if we flex his neck by 20 or 30 degrees. We are putting his head now in a position that is equivalent to whole whole pike position in which the gravity, the, the acceleration of gravity acts fully over the posterior canal cupula. So we started to look into modulation of nystagmus on pitch plane. We see this patient that presents an upbeating torsional nystagmus when she sits from this whole pike maneuver, right this whole pike maneuver, she also elicits the nystagmus when rolling the head to the right on, on the head you test. This nystagmus is persistent. If we wait one or two minutes, it will be there. We see that flexing the neck by 30 or 20 or 30 degrees increase the nystagmus velocity. and then we extend the neck by 20 degrees past the supine position that inhibits the, the nystagmus and then slowly start flexing the neck again and we will see that the nystagmus reappear. And is maximal when we flex the neck by 30 degrees. So, and some patient had persistent stimulatory and inhibitory nystagmus depending on the head position. We saw modulation of the nystagmus on when we uh, move the head on the pitch axis, and we start thinking that there probably was a graviceptic heavy cupola involved in the sitting up phenomenon. So there is there is no much literature regarding this topic. We uh, start uh, looking for it, but there is no too much written about it. The usual idea that we have when we think about a posterior canal heavy cupola is we expect to see is a sustained abetting if situational nystagmus on this whole pack maneuver. But there are series that reported that setting the, the head on this whole pack maneuver could set the posterior cupola in a neutral point in which gravity do not deflect the cupola 
either ampulofugally nor ampulopetally. And there are hypotheses that also talks about the that on this whole pike position, gravity could act deflecting the cupola on a inhibitory deflection, ampulopetally in this case. So we see how inter-individual difference on cupola angulation or the extent of the neck extension during the maneuver will deflect cupola either ampulofugally or ampulopetally. And if there effectively is a heavy cupola involved on this phenomenon, the sitting position shouldn't be a neutral position because on that position, gravity impacts over the cupola. We can see that here. So we think that there probably is some kind of set point adaptation that inhibits nystagmus on that position. So on the heavy cupula hypothesis, rolling the head ipsilaterally with the next flex by 30 degrees, uh, the, the equivalent to whole whole pipe position, will expose the posterior cupula to the maxion, maximal action of gravity and will be the uh, position in which we will expect the nystagmus with maximal intensity. That is what we saw. On the other hand, rolling the head contralaterally or on nose down will expose cupula to gravity in the other direction, also eliciting a sustained downbeating nystagmus, as we saw also in our videos. Other group of patients presented with sitting up nystagmus after canalid repositioning maneuver for typical posterior canal BPPB, but with variable findings on positional maneuvers, most of them involving horizontal canal. We will see a video This patient had a typical right posterior canal BPPV with its a bit in torsional nystagmus. We perform an EPLI maneuver and in the early retest less than 30 minutes after the original EPLI maneuver, we repeat this whole pipe maneuver and we can see a slight downbeat in nystagmus. And when we sit up the patient, we see how an a beating right torsional nystagmus appear. So he developed a sitting up BPPV. When we start exploring the different positional maneuvers, we explore the whole whole pipe position and we don't see any vertical nystagmus, but we see an horizontal left bidding nystagmus. Rolling the head to the left, elicits a change of the nystagmus direction with a right beating horizontal nystagmus. That is very light, but is still visible. Nose down position. It doesn't evoke vertical nystagmus, but we see the right within nystagmus. So this patient had a sitting up nystagmus plus an horizontal aposiotropic right nystagmus of the right horizontal canal. So those findings brought us the 
Bella Buki's hypothesis for type 2 BPPB to our minds. Maybe on some patients, a short arm posterior canal canalolithiasis could be behind the sitting up nystagmus. We will see an animation to clarify this hypothesis. We could think that on this whole pipe maneuver, the otoconia that is in the short arm of the posterior canal would fall towards the vestibulum. <coughs> and then when the patient sits up, the otoconia would fall again to the short arm of the posterior canal, eliciting a ampullofuel deflection and then the abiting torsional nystagmus. On whole pipe maneuver, there should not be action of gravity on the cupula because the otoconia is not attached to the cupula. But maybe a downbeat nystagmus as expression of the previous adaptation could arise. On whole pipe and whole whole pipe position, the otoconia could act as heavy cupula if some fragments of otoconia remains in the short arm of the posterior canal or could, or other fragments could be in uh, free floating on the vestibulum and it could enter on the other canals more probable, probably to enter on the horizontal canal as the video we show before. And, and in, on now down position, otoconia will fall from the posterior canal short arm to the vestibulum, and we should not see any nystagmus. So the proposed mechanisms for setting up nystagmus will be the first hypothesis that we mentioned, the periampular canalolithiasis, on support of that hypothesis is that as is the passing from nose down position to whole, whole pipe position provokes a paroxysmal nystagmus in some patients, as we saw with the diagnostic maneuver, and the switch to classic posterior canal BPPV in some patients. We can think that the debris could in some moment, some, in some time, pass through the anatomical restriction and uh, elicit a typical posterior canal BPPV. The other scenario, the heavy cupula hypothesis, on support of this hypothesis is the sustained excitatory and inhibitory nystagmus on provoking position that we saw on a group of patients that the nystagmus is elicited also when sitting up from contralateral Dix hole pike that in some patients had no latency when sitting up to the beginning of the nystagmus beating and the switch to the classic posterior canal BPPV variant. We can think that the otoconia attached to the canal side of the cupula could detach in some moment and fall to the uh, canal, posterior canal and converts to a classical posterior canal variant. And the vestibular lithiasis, short arm posterior canal canal lithiasis hypothesis on support of this hypothesis is that we saw lots of patients post canalit repositioning maneuver and in, on early retest. So we can think that the free otoconia that we move from the canal to the vestibulum is moving freely and with the chance of fall into the uh, posterior canal short arm. Also, the absence of response to canalid repositioning maneuver support this hypothesis because all the repositioning maneuvers are thought for uh, uh, to move out from the canals, uh, the otoconia. And now the otoconia will be in the vestibulum. So 
the uh, maneuvers are not effective. And the benefit from Brander of exercises, we can think that those exercises should disaggregate the otoconia and then facilitate its exit from the posterior canal short arm. So there is probably not a unique mechanism behind the sitting up nystagmus. And we think that it's also probable that heavy cupula and vestibulolithiasis with short arm posterior canal canalolithiasis could coexist in the same scenario with some fragment of otoconia remains uh, attached to uh, the vestibular side of the posterior canal and some other fragments are free floating on the vestibulum and then could enter to the horizontal canal, for example, or fall into the posterior canal and be the responsible of the abiting torsional nystagmus. The last video that I will show, this patient had had vertigo, positional vertigo 72 hours before, he got better but remained dizzy and out of balance. This whole pipe maneuver was negative, but when we sit the patient up, we see this very subtle upbeating torsional nystagmus, very, very subtle. And I showing this because you must look for the nystagmus. If you don't look for it, you will not see it. So this is important. We, you have to uh, see the eyes when sits the patient and we test the half hole pike position and now we can see clearly the abit intorsional nystagmus that is sustained, suggested by sustained um, stimulatory deflection of posterior cupula. And then we tested the nose down position that elicits a uh, less intense sustained downbeating contratorsional nystagmus suggestive of an ampulopetal inhibitory right posterior cupular deflection. So, sitting up nystagmus could arise from heterogeneous mechanisms. Therapeutic approaches will vary depending on the mechanisms involved. It could be very subtle and it could be missed if not explicitly looked for. Whole whole pike, whole, whole pike position and nose down are very important in order not to overlook this diagnosis. And could these mechanisms be related to post canalite repositioning maneuver or residual dizziness on some patients? That's an interesting hypothesis that I'm. Uh, we are currently investigating and we are prospectively evaluating more patients with these findings in order to better understand it, but they are unusual. Thank you for your attention and thank you for all the team of the Fundación Favaloro Neurotology Unit, Dr. Ivan Garcia and Dr. Alejandra Barreiro. I hope this time the video is okay. <laughs>